Hey guys, Dr. Justin Marcajani here. Today's video, we're gonna be talking about food allergies. Why do I have food allergies and what can I do to fix it? What does it actually mean? So first off, when we talk about food allergies, is a kind of a spectrum here. So we have like our typical anaphylactic allergy. A lot of these are inborn, right? Like you, you're born with them, like you have this severe allergy to peanuts or kiwi or just some kind of like, you know, a weird thing. And you have to use an EpiPen and you're having an anaphylactic reaction. You're having a lot of histamine produced. Usually there's swelling that's impacting breathing. You need that EpiPen, that adrenaline spike to really open that those airways up so you can breathe. Those are going to be more, your more severe IgE type of mediated type of allergens, right? Food allergens. Then you have your kind of more delayed that functional medicine looks at like these are IgG or IgA. You can have other types of T-cell mediated food allergies too. And these are going to be more delayed type of allergens. These are the ones that can cause joint pain or brain fog or fatigue, even some potential digestive issues. And these are going to be more of what I say conventional medicine or functional medicine tends to focus on more of them. It's hard to kind of nail them down because as you, let's say, pull away strawberries and you start eating blueberries, guess what? Now blueberries could be the allergen and not the, the strawberries because your immune system is constantly changing based on what is coming in. And usually the barrier, having good barrier integrity with that gut lining plays a major role because people don't realize it in your tummy or in your intestinal tract, that's actually still considered outside of your body. Isn't that weird? It's still outside your body. So if there's over permeability, let's call it a leaky gut, right? In literature, we call it gastrointestinal permeability. Then we're having more food allergens, more food proteins slipping to the bloodstream interacting with our immune system because 80% of our immune system is in our intestinal tract. And so if it's getting into the bloodstream, now we're having larger proteins interacting with our immune system. And now we have a higher risk for food allergies. So these are kind of the IgG, maybe IgA, right? IgA is more in the gut. It's that mucous membrane. IgG are more delayed mediated immune reactions. And then we have our intolerances. So think of like lactose intolerance. You have a hard time breaking down, let's say a certain sugar, like lactose is a milk sugar. You can't break it down. That's gonna cause digestive us upset, bloating, gas, diarrhea. So you see this with gluten intolerance, lactose intolerance. It's more of a digestive breakdown issue. And you could potentially still have allergies after that. You could typically have still a casein allergy. People typically don't have immune reactions to like sugars, like lactose is a sugar, for instance, it's more the protein. So proteins are the big ones. So gliadin or gluten is a protein. Casein, which is a dairy protein, is a protein. So you'll see people have reactions to the protein. You'll have more intolerances to potential proteins, but also some of the carbohydrates like with lactose intolerant. And so we can see those kind of reactions. So we have our IgA, IgG, even our T cell mediated reactions that are more in functional medicine world. And then we're going to have our intolerances, which are still going to be in conventional and functional world. And then of course we have our anaphylactic, which you know, most people realize that most people know that early on an allergist is going to be really good at diagnosing that. And they're going to know it and you're going to have an EpiPen. All right. So why, why is all this stuff happening? Usually there's a, a damaged gut lining that's driving a lot of this stuff, right? What's the underlying root cause? So gut integrity, so we have a gut barrier integrity. We have our gut lining, our gastrointestinal lining full of enterocytes, and they make up the tight junctions right here. And you have actin and myosin, and, and then the zonulin protein, when that goes up, that can really increase the unzipping of that gut lining. So if here's our gut lining, it starts to unzip with increased zonulin. Well, what drives the zonulin? So gluten sensitivity can be a big one that increases gut permeability. I see gluten, people are eating foods that are allergenic already, and then you're eating other foods with that, that can increase the gut permeability. That then allows the immune system to see and tag those proteins that are now with that gluten. So you have a higher risk for food allergies when you're eating other foods that are inflammatory or you're already having allergies too. So birds of a feather flock together. So if you're eating a lot of gluten with dairy, for instance, now you're increasing the likelihood that you're gonna make antibodies for dairy. That's one. Just having gut stress and gut inflammation from high cortisol, emotional stress, that's gonna break down the IgA, that immunoglobulin A. It's gonna break down the gut barrier and it's gonna make it increase risk. It's gonna increase your risk of having food allergy responses to those things because you're exposing your immune system to it. Things like glyphosate or Roundup are gonna decrease the brush border, make less enzymes in your intestinal tract. Anytime you don't break something down fully or completely with inadequate levels of hydrochloric acid or inadequate levels of bile or enzymes, those foods, those fats, those proteins, those carbs aren't broken down adequately. That can make it so those foods are now exposed to the immune system and your immune system is might like you to tag those foods and make uh, antibodies for them. So that's a factor. Um, 
other infections or bugs. If we start to have bacterial overgrowth, SIBO, H. pylori, other parasitic issues. Now those things can happen because of food allergy issues. They can happen due to lack of enzymes or acids or bile. They can happen because you're traveling and you're being exposed to a large bolus of that. All of those things can contribute, but then once infections enter in or overgrowth enter in, now it amplifies, it makes the food allergy issues worse. And now it, it weakens the enzymes and acids. There's a positive feedback loop that makes everything worse. So even though those first couple of factors, food or stress or gut permeability have to be there, but now as new bugs, as new stressors, bacteria, your typical SIBO bacteria, Citrobacter, Klebsiella, Staph, Proteus, Morganella, as more bugs come into the equation, into the environment, that now amplifies and creates a positive feedback loop for everything else I just mentioned. Also, antibiotics, right? People are getting exposed to lots of antibiotics. That's wiping out microbiome in general, good and bad. And then if we don't have enough good stuff there, good beneficial probiotics, Lactobacillus, Bifidobacter, your sporbiotics as well, your bacillus strains. Now the bad stuff grow back and now we have this dysbiotic rebound bacterial overgrowth. This is super important because good bacteria help produce and synthesize lots of B vitamins, vitamin K, lots of good nutrients. The acids from good healthy bacteria, they make it harder for bad bugs to grow. Acidophilus literally translates to acid loving. So we have good beneficial levels of bacteria. Those acids are produced that make it harder for bad bugs to grow. And so if we keep the gut lining intact, and we keep that gut lining supported with good nutrients like, let's just say, glutamine, DGL, aloe, these are good, soothing, healthy nutrients, bone broth, glycine, right? Bone broth, very high in glycine, very supporting for the enterocytes, very supporting for the gut lining, also very anti-inflammatory. That's going to also improve enzyme levels and acid levels and bile salt levels and help us to break down our proteins and fats much, much better. And then again, fermented foods are very important. We talked about dysbiotic bacteria. Well, we're not getting enough beneficial bacteria in our diet. And this is going to come from sauerkraut, kimchi, fermented pickles, maybe some low sugar kombucha. It's going to be great sources. Now, obviously, we can supplement with additional probiotics that are going to be very helpful. Lactobacillus, bifidobacter, even spore-based probiotics, very helpful if you're not eating it in your diet already. Now, if you already have a lot of bad bugs in your gut, these foods may actually cause a histamine reaction, brain fog. It may cause dizziness, lightheadedness. So if you already have histamine issues, you may not be able to utilize a lot of these beneficial foods. So that's where we would want to supplement. Again, we always want to work on if you're having probiotic intolerance where you're taking in probiotics, whether it's food or supplementally, and you're having negative symptoms, that tells me there's probably an imbalance in the microbiome. And we have to work on clearing out that terrain before we start adding supplemental, more beneficial bacteria or beneficial probiotic supplementation. So very important we look at that. Now, diet-wise, we want an anti-inflammatory, nutrient-dense, low-toxin diet. That is essential. That's very, very important. And so that could be a paleo template. It could be a paleo lower FODMAP template where we cut out some of the healthier FODMAPs. Now, these foods are good, but we may want to cut out garlic and onions. We may want to cut out some broccoli or some cruciferous vegetables. We may want to be steaming or sauteing um, a lot of our veggies and making sure that we have extra enzymes and extra acids on board. Definitely cutting out gluten, definitely cutting out dairy. These are important. We may also need to cut out some higher histamine foods depending on how sensitive you are. So again, you really need an individualized plan. I'm just trying to give everyone like generalized advice and then you can look at it and try to apply it. But in the end, you really want a customized plan. Um, so outside of that, lower FODMAP can be super helpful. Anti-inflammatory, nutrient dense, low toxin, paleo. It's a great first step. Again, getting some stool testing can be super helpful because we can look at what microbiome bacteria is way out of whack. Do we have any systemic inflammation markers? Do we have low bile salts? Do we have low enzymes, low acids? Um, do, what types of microbes do we have? Do we have H. pylori present? Do we have a parasite present? Again, the sicker someone is or the longer something's been there, the more we want to get some testing. I also like organic acid testing because it's very good at picking up fungal overgrowth. Fungal overgrowth can be very hard to, to, to pick up on a conventional or even a functional medicine stool test. And so having a organic acid test to look at some of these metabolites, whether it's tartaric acid or diarabinose or even bacterial markers like clostridium difficile or even like hipparate or benzoate, these are like dysbiotic bacterial markers, can be very, very, very helpful out of the gate. So very important there out of the gate.
Now, looking at everything else, of course, like lifestyle stress, very important, like sleep, managing stress. Anytime we get cortisol and stress out of control, that can cause that gut lining to get ripped up and that can increase um, undigested foods to the immune system, tagging these proteins and then increasing food allergenicity. And anytime our immune system is busy attacking foods, guess what? You're going to be tired. You're going to be fatigued. You're going to have brain fog. So you, you really want to take the stress off the immune system. And you're going to do that with good diets, with good supplementation, with good acid, good enzymes, doing some testing to get really specific at what we're dealing with. Because sometimes it could just be a little bit of dysbiotic bacteria. Maybe you have some low probiotic levels. Maybe your enzymes and acids are low. Maybe you're just, you're stressed, you need to move, you need to sleep better. It could be something very simple. Again, the longer something's been going on, things tend to get entrenched and tend to take, you know, there's usually the issue tends to get worse over time, right? Entropy happens, breakdown happens. And so you really want to look uh, deeper at, at everything here out of the gates. Again, not a huge fan of the functional medicine testing for food allergies, just because it's going to tell you, hey, don't eat beef. You say, I'm going to eat chicken and pork now. And now pork and chicken is a problem. Or it says, don't eat raspberries, you eat blueberries. And then you, this is like the, the whack-a-mole. And so I look, like to look at testing. It says, what's going to give me the best information to make a change that's going to be root cause um, versus palliative? And so we got to look at that. Now, I think food allergy testing can maybe be helpful if you already have a great diet and you feel great and you want to fine tune things. Maybe that's helpful. But if you have a lot of gut issues, if you love it, rotate it. That way your, your immune system is not seeing the same thing all the time and increasing the immune let's say reactivity to that food. And so it's good to have some level of rotation to it. So if you love it, rotate it. Hope it helps guys. Just kind of give you my kind of take on food allergies. Can you get them better? Yes, you can. Now, certain things may be genetic, certain gluten sensitivity, certain casein, certain foods may be problematic and maybe something you have to mostly keep out 80, 90, 100% of the time. I have an autoimmune condition, so I keep it out 99 to 100% of the time. If I sub something in there, it's cassava or yuca, or maybe I do a little bit of white rice or potato flour or something around the holidays. I try to always keep it out. Again, everyone's a little bit different. Some may not have to be as strict. Some may have to be more strict. If you have a known celiac issue, you may have to be more strict. You may never be able to eat grains in. I know some of the data on thyroid health shows that if you eat gluten, that could increase your thyroid antibodies for months potentially. And so you have to factor all these things in. But when in doubt, you know, always add in like a safe starch, whether it's a potato or a, a yucca or sweet potato or squash over grains in general, right? Grains are just a starch. And so you can find a healthier starch that fits into that category and still supports kind of your macro. So you feel good. But outside of that, you want to dive in deeper. I'll put my link down below. If you want to reach out to my staff and team, we're happy to support you functional medicine and wise. We see patients worldwide. So there'll be a link down below. Make sure you sub, make sure you subscribe, hit the bell for notifications. We do a lot of live videos. So love to see your comments down below.